finally ready to get underway. A best of five to say who is going to go up against Marine Lord in that final. Let's kick it off with an English Mirror matchup. And look at that. Oh, we're already warmed up. See, we don't even have to go past the part where we just watch people walk their scouts out. We're deep in it, Lytical. One minute and 30. We've missed everything. We might as well just go game two, right? Yeah, sure thing. I mean, look at that. One scout was added by each player and GG. <laughs> Anyway, spawning on the side on side of the map, it is going to be Beastie playing as the Blue English, and on the north, it is the Viper playing as the Red English. And that is a super fast wheelbarrow that you can see here for Viper. You can see on the top of the overlay, that's already a mill up and a wheelbarrow coming in for him. That's very early. You see, he's already chopping trees to be able to facilitate that. Yeah, that was something I, I wanted to talk about, but obviously we had to get in the game, and now we can actually dissect this, is the play styles, right? Is that when I thought about these two players and the way they play the English, it's fair to say that they're both quite cozy with the idea of going greedy and maybe going for a later timing, right? BC's always been seen as this methodical player, but the interesting part about Viper's recent iterations of the French and the English that I've been watching, he has to be the greediest player that I've actually seen in Golden League. Like, this guy is not afraid to drop multi-TCs if he sees any opportunity or go for exploitative eco gains like this opening instantly into the wheelbarrow. Yeah, I do agree with you. To be honest, what I would call Viper is a very smart greedy player because you see many players trying to play greedy, trying to drop free town centers and then just get killed by being overrun by units. But what Viper is doing so effectively is being able to diagnose when he can afford to be greedy and he really is able to translate that into massive advantages in many of these games. And this is one of his best skills, I believe. He can really diagnose when he can afford to be greedy. Yeah, and usually that comes through scouting. Something that actually, I, I have to give so much praise to Viper. You know, it was something that in the early days, the Craft Boys were, were kind of miles ahead of the competition in. It, it's maintaining vision early on. But I think that's something that Viper has really put a lot of effort into in the last one to two months, is making sure that, especially by that five to 15 minute barrier, like he understands what his opponent is doing because he parks scouts in critical locations. I 100% agree with you. And Beast himself, is also very high on the scouting. So in many mm -hmm. cases on his stream said that one of the most important things in Age of Empires 4 is scouting, scouting, scouting. So part of the reason why we're now seeing basically all players go with at least two scouts in Dark Age is because they want to make sure that they know what the opponent is doing. Even if they use one of those scouts to collect sheep, the other one is going to be gathering information. And in many cases, now you see players, if they lose their scout, they actually sacrifice a villager and train a new scout on the town center because that is how valuable information is. I mean, you can see how valuable it is by the fact that both English players went for a second scout, right? This is not a sieve that necessarily needs the sheep. And you can't even argue that getting the second scout takes sheep away from an opponent that needs it. Both of you are going to be going hard into farms fairly quickly due to the fact that they're 50% cheaper for you. In fact, I feel like the English is the only sieve I 90% of the time see going farms. Every other sieve tries to go for these pocket economies. Yeah, indeed, and this makes the economy of the English very, very compact and hard to raid, and that's one of the advantages that you get with this civilization. And as you pointed out, it is going to be mostly farms, but still, having some extra sheep under your town center could be a great fallback option. So if you can't really afford to go for more farms, then having a couple of extra sheep can act as a great buffer. So obviously, there is definitely some positives in getting that second scout out. But as you pointed out, the most important thing is going to be the information. And look at that. That is stone being mined by Beastie. Ooh. So we talked about greed. How about that? That's a second town center likely in the making for Beastie. It's surprising as well. Like, I, I feel like usually these type of players, when they're in this kind of neck and neck matchup, they make this choice when their stone is at the back. But as you can see, for both players, if they, cho if they chose to go for the TC build, they're going to be showing it off to the opponent. In fact, you can already see Viper has scouts watching Beastie do it. He's got the count. He's right there just kind of doing Sesame Street, counting the amount of villagers working on that stone line to know how much time he's got before Beastie begins the eco boom. Yeah, exactly. He can also click that stone deposit and see exactly how much stone was taken. And it looks like Viper is going to send out the archers. And look at that. That's a stable Ooh. being dropped. That's their thing. And Beastie saw it immediately. So you see the importance of that scouting out there. Both of these players want to know what the other one is up to because information warfare is so, so key. We're likely going to see that scout harassing that longbow tiny bit. Obviously, you can't kill it, but every single bit of damage done is going to help you. Yeah, and of course, the scout does heal, so it's not like you can even try and pepper him down with just two longbows. And, and the crazy part is Viper already deviated from his eco build, right? Like, he only went for the one farm, I believe. So this investment being spotted out so early, it bodes well for Beastie fans. Like, he can get the counter in place. But for right now, it's just going to be an outpost and a TC, which should layer his base 
quite effectively against the first few Lombos. Yeah, that's a beautiful base layout here for Beastie. I mean, look at that. Two town centers. One of them is going to be on a new forest. It's actually close to the mill as well. And on the front, you do have a defensive tower on your gold mine. And Beast is actually sending out some more villagers to stones. So I believe that he wants some arrow slits in placements on those towers. Yeah, I mean, you got it, right? You're playing the English. It's kind of a given. If you're going to be spamming outposts, you need to get the first layer of upgrades out. And that, that does kind of put Viper on the clock right now. He hasn't fallen back or slowed down. The production is still increasing. Looks like he's now going back to pad the farmlands further. But remember how delayed he was. Like, by the time he's pushing out the stable units, he only had one farm down. So economically, he's already lagging behind where BC is. And it might make it difficult, especially if Beastie completes these small enclosures, which he can due to how small the gaps are, you're not going to have a raid in because it's not just this side. Look at the west side of his corner. He's got small tree lines that he can easily branch between for Palisades, meaning there's no easy access for Viper. Yeah, this is a perfect base here for Beastie. I mean, especially with that defensive tower protecting the gold mine, it's going to be very difficult for Viper to do a lot of damage to him. And Beastie, we know that he's a slow and methodical player. He loves to be in these situations where he is just completely walled up, focusing on his economy. And you see, there is already, well, right now just one villager lead, but that soon will increase in the favor of Beastie. He has yet to start adding farms, but obviously he was prioritizing those walls. He was prioritizing those towers. And Viper, so far, is going to be unable to push him. And it looks like Viper is just going to turn this into a fast castle here, try to punish his opponent in castle rather than feudal age. It's a smart idea as well. Like, you can't recover by saying, I'm going to go for a second town center too. Like, you might as well get Castle Age and at the same time still be saying you're going to get that second town center, right? Because that's the benefit you have, the King's Palace. And the cool thing as well is there's no reason for him to go White Tower because Beastie hasn't really shown a single iota of aggression so far eight minutes into this game. Yeah, that's a great point, that there is no point for Viper trying to make a second town center in Feudal when he could just make a second town center as his Castle Age landmark, and that's something that sets this civilization mirror apart from other civilization mirrors. In any other civilization mirror, this would be a much more concerning thing for Viper, because he couldn't just go up to Castle Age and start cutting into that villager deficit, but with this Civ, he could just go up to Castle, and I mean, Beast is gonna have a slight villager lead, but we're probably going to be talking about a five or so villager discrepancy, which is... Perfectly acceptable for Viper, him being in Castle Age and his opponent still being in Feudal. Yeah, that's that's the, the thing. You think there's a discrepancy, but then if you map it out, if he has a reasonable amount of people working food on farms, he's got an additional 5% gathering on the farms being in Castle compared to Feudal, right? So from that influence, it kind of actually mitigates the difference. It's a very interesting interaction to think about. Um, in this situation, though, I wonder if Viper's going to keep pushing knights instantly, or rather, you know, horsemen two knights at the beginning of castle just to try and hold midfield. Because the one advice she then gets is BC is still locked in a corner. And when you do go for the multiple TCs, we've all been there, right? We're happy campers. We sit in our corner. Two minutes later, we look back and somehow the whole wasteland is barren because we've already tapped it dry. <laughs> Indeed, I agree with the knight approach. Because you could accomplish a lot of things with knights. First of all, if you have two or three knights, you can commit against that tower and try to pick off a villager underneath. But more importantly, knowing Viper, he's going to prioritize relics. Because we know he's going to be behind by villagers. It seems like it's going to be eight villagers deficit for him. The easiest way to cut into that short term and also strengthen yourself long term is picking up the relics. And that's exactly what Viper is doing. Beast is not contesting the map at all. Why not pick up four or five relics and set myself up with gold income for the next 20, 25 minutes easily? Yeah, it's a cool identification as well. Like, he understands BC can't match the same castle timing with the secondary TC. He's basically crippled his ability to go for the, the infinite gold. And I think the cool thing about this is Viper and Fury should get three, if not more, of the relics unless BC moves out in the midfield. Meaning, should this game go hyper late, you're talking infinite resources, only one player is likely to have three, possibly four of these relics. Indeed, it's going to be infinite resources for both with the enclosures upgrade for English, but Viper's gonna have a larger infinite, you know. Mathematicians, you know, sometimes they talk about infinite and then infinite or something that's larger than infinite. Infinite, infinite? Yeah, like- the, Infinite the, the, plus one. Ah, yeah, that's, there that's is things like not. that. All right, Cosledge coming in for luckily, Beastie. We're not a math stream. <laughs> We're yeah. just here for the explosions, okay? We don't <laughs> even get them anymore, Lidda. They ruined the explosions. Nuke ships are gone, my Maganels are gone. The only thing we're getting is eco explosions, as I believe that is going to be a third TC for Beastie. Yup. Talk about the greed out there. Oh, Knight moving in here, getting some reasonable damage done. And this is why it's so valuable for Viper to just send him one Knight. 
Eventually, he's going to lose it to the Town Center Fire, but he can check out what Beastie is doing at the back of his base, something that he couldn't do with a scout. Maybe even pick off a villager and he sees the King's Palace. That's the key thing. And Viper's gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna have to do something with this. And you see, with Run free Town Centers, the free Town Centers, the concern I think for Beastie is that, as you pointed out, he's going to deplete those resources inside his base so rapidly. I mean, he's gonna be at 80 villagers in the next three or four minutes. He is, which means he has to come out, right? This is where things have to kind of transfer for Beastie. He's gone Eco Boom, but now he needs to get midfield control. The Knights can be problematic for this, but as we see with the opening night, like Viper didn't really achieve anything. And I think this is the credit of English TCs, right? They fired double the amount of arrows. So it's very hard to dive even with heavily armored units. Yeah, exactly. And of course, you do have the network of castles bonus as well. That's going to buff those few longbows under the town center. So. Yeah, Viper isn't going to be able to accomplish much with those knights, but obviously it's all about that poking and probing and harassment and just making sure that he has an easy time picking up those relics because as long as Beast is defending against these, he is not going to contest the relics and that is a triple stable switch for knight play by Beastie. Yeah, this has just turned into a giant size comparison. I'll show you mine, you show me yours. And right now, like considering that Viper only has a few nights out in the field, like Beastie in the next three to four minutes, she'd be able to get midfield dominance. So as critical Viper starts to collect these relics now, you can see the second one's already on his way back. He's heading for the third. This could very easily turn into four relics yoinked by Viper, at which stage he's probably okay with surrendering the midfield. It's then a question mark of what BC wants to do, because while knights are good for raiding and midfield control, they by no means end a game. You're not the French. This isn't Feudal Age. Indeed, that is the case. And it looks like Viper is going to be rather successful collecting relics. You can see on the overlay that we already have him one garrison and two more on the way. Knights are hitting the field though for Beastie, so the window for Viper to collect those relics is slowly closing. Especially with the wildlife turning on him. And someone put a leash on that dog. In the meantime, Viper trying to put a leash on Beastie, keep him contained for the moment. But I believe that's the new Blacksmith going down. So Beastie's just trying to tech rush up to get the quality of a quantity, at least in his favor. And Viper, I mean, it is a side investment. But remember, like when you get all these relics this early, it doesn't feel like a risk. That's the beautiful thing about what the Viper done here. He understood that Beastie didn't want to come out of his base and he's exploited the map as best you can as the English. Yeah, that's indeed the case. And it's going to be an investment that returns its price very, very easily. So we're talking about him already sitting at free relics. Beast is also dropping his own monastery. So he knows very well that he needs to pick up at least one, preferably two relics. And Viper, he's wandering in that left-hand side corner looking for relics. Is he aware of the two relics in the bottom part of the map? Because it doesn't seem like it. it, it it's possible he's just going wide, right? To try and avoid aggression. Yeah, so he does mm -hmm. see one of them at least. Down here, it kind of makes sense the angle he's taken, right? He doesn't want to run into Beastie's forces on the defensive in the center. Or the well. sacred side. You run into the sacred side, and mm -hmm. that is a, basically a sign for Beastie that, hey, I have a monk there that you can pick off with your knights. It's important that he doesn't get spotted there, because one thing you can know, Viper has started to peel back in the mid. He's not actually aggressing or containing Beastie anymore. He's respecting the fact that he's now out quantitied, right? Like the production rates we just highlighted earlier beastie will catch up and surpass you and also if you ever try to take a fight on the defense against the english in a mirror matchup the big difference is there the glowing aura one side has the attack speed and the other doesn't indeed so it's always defender's advantage over here and beastie is more than happy to sit on this lead you see he's going for the relics as well but now he has built up a 15 villagers lead viper is coming in with the knights volo is being popped by beastie and it looks like the monk is gonna get killed i mean it was likely going to be the case, and Viper is going to pick that fourth relic up as well for himself. Yeah, you only see doodle and off he goes. Because you only got one knight out here, there's nothing you can do to deter it. It's a really good move by Viper. Like, he still has the military count in his favor on the knights, and he's using that to the full exploitation. And Beastie, while he is building up this sizable force that can move in and maybe do something later with the Lombo detachment, it does mean that he's forfeited this 15 minute window. And that means that you kind of have to fall back to that late game, right? Like you have to think about a timing before we go hyper intensive Imperial Age, but you need to reach a critical mass where you can actually go forward, set up an outpost and maybe begin to siege. Whereas Viper is comfortably in a just sit back and do nothing state now. Beastie is going to have that next relic being brought in. So it's going to be four to one. It's notable as the monk on the right side does get picked off. It's notable that Beastie over chopped his wood line. So that is something that he needs to be cautious of because Viper could run in with like 15 knights at any time. And that's going to be a growing concern. Um, it's the wood on the left side, I do believe. 
Yeah, it was fully like protected, right? I believe it was actually close enough that it was actually fully layered over, kind of weirdly enough, that generation. Uh, but as you can see, he's got a little gap in, and Viper is waiting here. BC's also in the midfield, so he's not guarding at home. Like, this could hit him hard. The timing on this could be perfect for Viper. He needs to be able to prioritize the protection of his own villages before shifting in. And so far, he hasn't moved those knights. So it's just all reactionary. Yeah, and that's quite a few villagers going down here from Viper. Oh my. That's oh my. a problem. Okay, Beastie not only gets the good value, he peels off just in time before Viper would have enveloped him there. That would have been a heavy hit as well. We have to remember that unit, every single one of these knights is 240 resources. Even five of them set you back a decent amount at this point in the game. Yeah, and the key like thing, the key thing is that if you lose that small group, that means that you just lost a certain portion of your army, whereas Viper didn't lose anything, basically, and the critical mass is just growing for your opponent. Look at that in the middle, though. That is going to be longbows opening up against the villagers underneath that castle. Can Viper stop this? I, I, I don't know if it's going to be quick enough. The issue that Viper has is kind of hemorrhaging in multiple locations. Beastie peeled off to the east side after distracting the knights, went on the woodline on the west side, and it was all the distraction for this. We know Beastie loves building keeps on sacred sites. Especially here on Dry Arabia, and he's gonna get it up because there were no knights here. Viper was distracted on two fronts. Beastie did sacrifice four or five of these knights, but it's worth it because now he holds the center of the map. And that is a key position, as you pointed out. It's all about that network of castles or soon to be network of citadels bonus. And that's a great staging ground for Beastie to have. Looks like we're going to have a scuffle on the right side with the knights. Viper still has a massive amount of knights though, and that's a growing concern for Beastie. Viper could opt to just run into Beastie's base and just devastate the economy. Currently, Beastie is a 21 villagers lead, but that could disappear in just a split second. Yeah, I believe this is what they call the Magano line strategy, right, from French World War II. If you see these giant fortresses, why not just go around them? Because that's the issue, right? Beastie, he's only got one of them up so far. This strategy is good if he can start to layer them out to the east and west sacred site. But as it stands right now, Viper not only has a short route to his opponent's base, he also has the movement speed advantage of this many knights. Yeah, precisely. So he could just flank around, though it wouldn't be historically accurate to see the English just walking around the Maginot line. But, well, wouldn't hey, be the man. first time in we, history. We've had a, quite the historical obsession with the French, okay? Like, at what point is the French <laughs> the English and the English French, right? I mean, he is blue. It's close enough for me. <laughs> and now here we go. More fortifications. Beastie is role-playing this piece. But this is a little bit more effective. Covers the east side. Maybe not quick enough to stop Viper from getting in entirely. But he is starting to create that choke point. And both players having similar ideas. Only one of them is using stone luck. Um, Viper is also stonewalling on the right side, so I think it could be just the fact that he's a little low on stone. But the magical thing here is that both players were thinking about the same thing in the very same moment. Both of them were like, okay, this is gonna go long, I need to start fortifying my base. And that they started to do. Viper still has a couple of knights on the left side, by the way, that could jump on those lumberjacks any time. Yeah, uh, did, did they think they're playing like one of those games when you stand still long enough, you become stealthed? It's starting to feel that way. Like they've just been sitting there as if Viper just forgotten about him. Although he's got bigger things to deal with here. He's busy masquerading blue knights as he chokes off Beastie and kills off a decent quantity of the cavalry. Feels like he's definitely doing a good job of keeping that number advantage in the melee. But you do have to be concerned about the other detail here, which is that Beastie is actually switching over to a strong static force. Spearmen, man at arms, and a sizable quantity of longbowmen ahead of Viper. And the other concern here for Viper is that if you look at Beast's resources, I mean, he's not super far away from Imperial. And an Imperial Age power spike here could be massive. Knights are now moving in on those walls. Well, look at that. They don't know about uh, the gold miners. He actually uh. sees it, but there is so many things to pay attention to that Viper isn't going to notice. That would have been a juicy, juicy jackpot to pick up. And maybe, maybe he's colorblind and he thinks, oh no, no, he's realized these aren't my Englishmen. He'll turn around and he will pinch him on both sides. Knight's now trying to react to this, but the villagers aren't even pulling back. BC only now shifts them off the line, but plenty of them are going to be going down. And now look in the center. The keeper's fallen. Knight's are in position. BC has still not enclosed himself. He actually might get picked on multiple eco lines in the next two minutes. Indeed, and as you pointed out before, it is the mobility component. Viper's got 21 knights, whereas looking at Beastie's army, it's only nine knights. Most of that army that Beastie has is infantry, men at arms, longbow, spearmen. Those will struggle catching up with all these raids, and you see, that woodline has more holes than Swiss cheese right now. Mm. Well, that's a good thing we added the emote today then, isn't it? Because it seems kind of fitting right now. I mean, the other thing it kind of feels like we're heading towards is that we should have the Benny Hills theme tune playing, because this is the issue. When you don't actually enclose your base against cavalry, 
with such a static force, you're just going to be running left, right, and center when you want to be moving in for a decisive victory. And now they actually pinch you in the corner. Viper, not in a position to move away from this. It's just going to be a bad trade overall for him. Too many man arms, too many spears, and definitely too many Lombo moves for him to contest with. That's a terrible, terrible fight for Viper. I mean, he just charged into Spearman with those knights. He probably wasn't looking or he just knew that he can't really escape because look at the walls on the left side. Beastly is just expanding his base even more. That's true. But one thing that Viper has got going from the moment, he's holding that choke point, right? He deleted the keep. He's got a sizable force there, but look at this move now, a beastie. He crawls out like a slivery snake, ironically against the snake, and sets up a keep on the right side because he knows that this is starting to turn to resource drain. They're both going to have to come out of that midfield and he's going to be the one with the keep advantage. Yeah, that's going to be a great position once again for him to hold. And now he's setting up his own trebuchet, so he's ready to push Viper's base here. But Wait. the Mad are now unleashed. The small Ganels? Looking very small there. I, 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 Viper, I feel like he's the only player that still thinks this is a good idea. And he's slowly come to the realization it's just not worth it. The Maganel doing no damage here in the trades. Beastie taking out the front line quickly. Lombo count looking pretty healthy on both sides, but a clear edge starting to grow for Viper here will force Beastie to retreat. Yeah, Viper started adding Man at Arms himself, and this is not something that we talked about yet. He just overpowered the forces of his opponent, and now Beast is gonna have to call off his forces because Beastie, he just got drained dry with the Man at Arms, but that's the reason why. Beastie went to Imperial, he spent all his resources on that, and now he's gonna have the Vingard Palace working for him, and he can get the Imperial Age upgrades. Viper suddenly got onto the timer because once those Imperial Age upgrades come in, he won't be able to take direct fights. Yeah, but Viper's almost pop-capped. He actually has a good staging point to now push him, but he needs to be fast. Like, when you see that tick up come out, you've got two to three minutes before BC can fully reap the rewards of Imperial. Now, when we look at the resources back in BC's base as well, because he's set up that keep on the east side, he's not going to be starved anytime soon. So it really is Viper on the clock. He even needs to get rid of the pocket ego that BC's built, or he needs to find a way to strong arm into his base. Indeed, there are some palisades that he could use to get through. Those are lightly defended. Obviously, on the far right side, we do have stone walls for Beastie. Um, I wonder if we have enclosures completed already for Beastie, because that's the biggest power spike you're getting with Imperial Age for the English. That's going to be a massive boost to your eco. And uh, what is going to show us? Yeah, we have enclosures, or at least it's being researched. So it's going to be a great gold income for Beastie, something that Viper isn't going to have for the next few minutes yet. Yeah, you know, as the English, step one is you get enclosures in terms of the map walling yourself in. And then later on, you get the actual good enclosures that you want. And those enclosures are not there to protect Beastie. As it turns out, the Lombos are going to reach in. It looks like Viper's had enough of this. The Trebuchet's now reacting to the right side. But uh oh, the Knights have been ignored. Looks like he's trying to shift away now, but he's going to lose one or two of these trebuchets because he ignored them for too long. He's just got a bunch of AFK man at arms looking the other way like they've been bribed by Beastie. We didn't see anything here. Yeah, not at all. The numbers for Beastie are not necessarily convincing, only 25 longbows against 36, but he's going to have the Imperial Age upgrades in a matter of seconds, and that's going to swing the battle in his favor. He's focusing a lot on protecting that proxy eco that you pointed out before. Looks like he's going to charge in, trying to stop Viper's castle, but Viper's gonna get the keep up, and with that, he has the Network of Castles bonus as well. And now look at the wraparound. Like, the, the knights are just chasing away all the Lombos. Your man at arms are kind of alone in no man's land. The keep is going to go up. Now you're forced away. In the retreat, all your MAA is going to be going down. And it's all because you didn't even have the Lombos to assist. And this is the, the awkward issue with the MAA, right? They're such a slow unit. They're very chunky. But once they're in, it's very difficult to get them out. And look at that, he's going to position the longbows on the walls. I don't even remember if I've seen a single pro 1v1 <laughs> game where we see this feature being used. That is a massive buff to those longbows. I mean, we're talking about plus two range on those longbows and a massive amount of range damage reduction for them standing on those walls. So Viper cannot mm -hmm. take that fight at all. That's a great defensive position for Beastie to be in. Yeah, so for those that aren't aware how the walls work, you not only get two extra weapon range to whatever unit the range is standing on top of it, you also get 66% reduced damage. What this basically means is that Lombos got up to nine tile range. The reason this is important is with the recent Maganel nerfs, it means that Lombos are actually better than Maganels if you add in a wall. Because they do more damage, they take less damage. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done being mean to Maganels for now. You can take it, really cool. <laughs> uh, Viper is up to Imperial himself. Population is now pretty close. Viper, slightly larger army though. And honestly, I get the impression that this could be a very long game. And this is not the first time that these two have played a very long game. We talked about this one in the pregame show that, boy, oh boy, did they have that wonder game out there. 
This time around, I'm fairly certain that if we get to that stage, Viper is going to pay attention more to the Wander notifications. Yeah, do you think it's one of those situations where he just got like little sticky notes on his monitor? It's like, has Beastie been sending troops constantly for the last five minutes? Have I seen any like retraction to his corner? Have I seen any highlights in the back corner? Luckily, we're not going to see a Wander anytime soon. We can see with the numbers. They're both heavily invested right now. Beastie is admittedly floating a lot of wood, and this could be a switch hard into trebuchets, which he only has two of right now. But he doesn't need to rush it, right? He went for the Wingard Palace, which means he is actually pushing them out for a very big discount with another slew of units alongside. Yeah, exactly. That's the power of the Wingard Palace. It's, it's not even the extra units that you're getting. Shirting, Man at Arms, Longbowman, Knight. It's that cheap trebuchet, that very cheap trebuchet that you're getting, allowing you to get to like five, six, seven very easily. And you really don't have to care about losing them, to be honest, because they are so, so cheap. Yeah, whereas Viper, you know, you see the multi-siege workshops, you see his choice, he goes hard in the bombards now, a quick way to delete through. And this is the difference in approach. Viper, we said he was kind of feeling like he's on the clock, even though he's got a lot more infinite resource generation with the relics, but it's the, the resource slog in the middle, right? Beastie, with this trebuchet build, it's more about slowly building that critical mass and efficiently using your eco, whereas Viper is very much burning the candle at both ends, right? Like, he's got 10 good minutes of aggression before he starts to deplete all of his resources. But those 10 good minutes of aggression are starting to pay off as you see the Man Arms trying to intercept those trebuchets. Flaming Arrow's already in for Beastie, though. And in terms of military upgrades, he seems like he's always one step ahead of compared to oh. Viper for the last five or so minutes. He oh. brashes his way through those walls, and oh, that's Viper's eco exposed. I like how Beastie's like, if he just keeps hugging the wall, he won't see me, right? No, the walls give vision, Beastie. Get away from them. Go deeper. He won't be able to find anything here. Maybe you could burn down the monastery. That would delay the gold trickle in for Viper. And in the meantime, it's all a distraction because he shifts in with the trebuchets, focusing onto the keep and goes even deeper with the MAAs, forcing the main army to the back corner. This, by the way, is a phenomenal play when you're in a static against static army composition. I have to agree with you. See, you see, he is even targeting the males over here. He just wants Viper to pursue. It's all about that one. Making sure that Viper pursues so many longbows, so many men at arms are just distracted by this one. And this gives him a window to push the middle. Although it looks like he might lose those trebuchets. So in the end, by the time these forces are clean up, Viper might still be able to keep that keep alive. Yeah, you probably go full sleep before the MA die though. They're so chunky with the armor clad. It's, it's such a bulky unit. Trebuchet. One final molly, not quite enough. Lombo should be able to finish it off, but no. They were targeting the, the MAA. They could have finished the trebuchet. So instead he doesn't get the good trade, but the Bombard should keep Beastie at bay. Yeah, the Bombard should technically keep him at bay, although you gotta respect those Longbows out there with the flaming arrows. And let's not forget, those Bombards are very expensive for Viper. Viper who hasn't finished the Enclosures upgrade yet. So you see, he's struggling for gold. He does have the four relics, but he's got 800 gold per minute out of which 400 is from the relics. So he's got a very minimal gold income from other sources. And that is a concern. It's going to make it much more difficult to replenish every single last Bombard. We, we did confirm that Viper got enclosures, right? It, I think it's just he's been forced off of all the farms. He's finally mopped them up, so he should be able to get back to business. But yeah, that, that's why. That's the effect of it. Like, that's the beautiful thing about Beastie doing this. It's not only the fact that he forces Viper's army away from the front line. It's also, you don't need to kill Eco. Just by putting them in their TCs, you are killing the economy of your opponent, at least temporarily, to give you an advantage. Indeed, you see Viper try to blast his way through those walls out there. And speaking of those Ecos, Beast is still able to control the majority of those neutral resources, and that's giving him such a huge edge over here in these battles. And when wow. I snipes the Bombards, oh, that's two Bombards lost. That's painful. And he turns away, he's like, Man of Arms, you've done your, your duty. Time for you to rest eternally, soldiers. I mean, in fairness, it's still actually a valuable trade. When you look at the maps behind these units, like Bombards are a thousand resources. Each Man of Arms is only 120. So yeah, pretty affordable unit to throw away. And still, it looks like Viper. This has been the kind of curse for his base, right? He never actually stonewalled the left side. So BC can just keep it coming in with small trickles of troops to keep him busy in his own base. Yeah, and Beastie is everywhere on this map, really. So he's been trapping down castles on the right side. He has been focusing a lot on the middle as well. And as you point out, he has also been pretty active, pushing left side. And look Ooh. at that. And this is sort of a bait here by Beastie, trying to get those men at arms and longbows close to those walls. He's going to have hell unleashed with those longbows. Flaming arrows, network of citadels with the wall bonus. He lost the trebuchets, but I mean, I value the effort and the idea of this bait. Yeah, honestly, like watching the longbows on the wall there, it's kind of like watching... 
actual medieval longbows versus kind of 40th century laser longbows, really, isn't it? it? It's just ridiculous how much range you get. And now it looks like he actually comes out to play. Surprising choice here, but he does at least have the attack speed buffer, remember? So that's going to even up the trades between them. It looks like it should be favorable for Viper, but it won't. Especially considering what BC is doing on the left side. He raids in again. Man at arms aren't prioritizing the bombards. Choke point is holding for the moment for Viper. But the issue still remains that he's not really gaining any ground. He's stuck in the mud in this midfield. And while Beastie keeps poking and prodding at the bear back on his eco lines, Viper hasn't been able to do the same. Yeah, army numbers are looking better and better for Viper, though he's at steady 86. And Beastie somewhat struggling with population over here, current at 184. And we are seeing a lot of longbows fall. One of the concerns here for both players eventually will be that the most difficult resource to access will be wood. And that is mm -hmm. going to be a concern in the long run, because obviously we still have a lot of men at arms clashing into each other, but you see quite a lot of longbows and bombards are hitting the field, and those are very wood heavy. And you know what I love about this map, Lytical? You know, we've got the new King of the Hill. It feels really arenary. That wood line in the center of Dry Arabia, given what you just stated, feels really arenary because it's going to be a bloodbath for wood in the center of this map. Exactly. You have infinite food, infinite gold, but what about wood? You're basically the only thing that you need for those longbows because you have infinite food, but how about the wood that you need for those longbows? And Flaming Arrows is also missing for Viper, so that's also giving a slight edge Ooh. for Beastie with his longbows. You say slight, with how reliant both of them are becoming on Lombo, it feels a lot more than slight. And look what Beastie just done. He's done with Lombos. Screw range. He just wants to get in range and then blunder blast his opponent away as he goes into the hand cannon is. Oh, I love that. I mean, especially if you have a strong meat shield in front, the men at arms, hand cannoneers are very population efficient and they do deliver a big, big punch. So it's going to be a great response to the men at arms of the opponent as well. And they don't even cost wood. So it's actually a better response than crossbowmen because the crossbows would cost you wood and they are less general purpose than hand cannoneers are. Hand cannoneers are a very nasty unit to deal with, especially now that mangonels have been nerfed. They're chunky boys as well. I mean, it's very easy to forget when we talk about how pricey the unit is. In fairness, it has a decent health pool. And because mangonels are no longer a good solution to clump ranged infantry, it means you are more likely to get your bang for buck. And look what BC does. Even more stone walls, he says. I'm slowly but surely going to create a tomb for you in which you will never escape from. And he's been trapping down religious. lumber camps even. So it's like, okay, I'm trying to cut you off from wood. And you see villagers are rioting on the right side. Viper is trying to pursue those traps with villagers. Men at arms will be the response though. On the left side, the walls were incomplete though, and that is going to be quite a few trebuchets falling. But that's the magic of the Wingard Palace. They're so, so cheap that you really won't sweat losing one or two. You know, I was about to praise Beastie QT for really giving a damn about deforestation as a problem. Then I, when we look on the left side, and we just see that he's actually munching away so much of the tree lines there. So Viper, able to raid in here, has finally reacted to this many villages, and Beastie... Okay, finally. But it took... I don't know... 40% of the people there, but he finally realized he was actually being pinched on the side. And you can see the effect on the eco. Below the 100 eco mark for the first time in what feels like, what, six, seven, eight minutes? Potentially more than that. I mean, Beastie took a big punch in the face with those forces out there. He's down to 92 eco. He's got a pretty decent resource bank, but now he's going to have to clean up those mad arms. And as you pointed out, for a long time, this is the first time that Viper was able to hit Beastie's eco, but that hit came in very strong. And this is going to give a lot of momentum here for Viper. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He ain't done with that hit. He's going deep. He's playing the same move that Beastie done to him. Follow me, Beastie son. I'm going to show you something in your back corner. And while you're away, I'm going to take the victory in the center because Beastie is outnumbered here. Hand cannon is. Are the premium unit that can save him, though. However, the attack speed buff is there for Viper. Viper not prioritizing the hand cannon is, however, which means these trades for PC are phenomenal right now. He's butchering the front line of Viper, and it means that after this, the Lombo might be in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, this was the best that this could have gotten for Beastie. I mean, now the hand cannoneers are getting taken down by the longbows, but so many men at arms fell in this battle for Viper. Could have been a lot more efficient, but obviously he's trying to make sure that he's maximizing his efficiency with those raids. Just action all across the map, really. I mean, see, here's the thing. We, we thought when they both picked English, they wanted to just have a fun game of Age Empires 4. 
Judging by what Viper's Man at Arms are doing, how far they just ran, it was actually they wanted to do the London Marathon because both players so far have been employing the same strategy to delay this game. And as they do force that army to the back of each other's bases, every time there's these villagers out in the center with their, with their lumberjacks suits on and their gold miners at it, just tapping away at that finite resource in the center. I mean, this matchup here, Viper versus Beastie, suddenly it starts to become a tra um, tradition sort of to have five hour long games between these two because this <laughs> game isn't going to end anytime soon i mean beast is back on track with the villagers now the bombard is trying to take down his keep he's going to respond in kind with the villagers i think he can take down the bombards before the longbows and men at arms retaliate yeah you gotta respect the peasantry my friend all right they brought down plenty of kings over the years and they will easily bring down the king of siege here the bombards are gonna fall and it will be expensive some villages but yeah, yeah. That's, that's the thing, right? Like, these villagers are only 50 resources each. You shrug your shoulders at that. And now you turn around and kill what remains as he arrives with the hand cannon is. And, and remember, folks, a small quantity of this is damn good. It's a chunky unit, so a few longbowmen will not be able to take it out, even though it has a range advantage over the hand cannon is. Viper now queuing up the Wingard army himself. He didn't really operate with a lot of trebuchets so far. I think he's realizing that, okay, bombards are way too expensive to lose now, so it has to be trebuchets with the Wingard army. He still has one bombard in queue, and now adding chemistry as well. So he either thinks about adding hand cannoneers himself, or he wants to continue with bombards, which is a little risky in my perspective, because you lose those bombards, you're going to lose so many resources. We talked about that multiple times. Meanwhile, east side, fight coming out, but you can see a, a discrepancy here for Beastie. Beastie is struggling to replace the range he's lost, and, and this is where the shifts have come. Remember Viper, he put himself on the clock when he went into the Bombards. Then Beastie matched that clock timing, as in putting himself at that stressing point when he went for hand cannoneers. And what is the response of Viper? Lombos! Million and one Lombos, and look at the pew pew fly here! The attack speed is juiced up so much that even the man at arms cannot hold against that. Yeah, that is just machine gun levels of firepower we're talking about with network of citadels, flaming arrows as well. The concern for Viper will be replenishing those because we talked about this multiple times. Wood is becoming less and less accessible all across the map. And the good thing here for Beastie is that Man at Arms and Hand Gunners is a unit composition he can spam for the next 15 days if he wants to because he's got infinite mm. food and gold from his farming eco. Yeah, and that's what they're racing towards, right? They're trying to transition in a way that instead of saying, I'm going to counter X unit, it's I'm going to counter your economy. That's the weird kind of dynamic that's at play here. A lot of games we talk about, oh, your opponent pushed cavalry, you push spear. In this game, it's like you see your opponent invest a lot of gold. You find a way of cheaply killing that gold off. And then you yourself try to go for something that's food heavy. It's a very interesting dynamic that's occurring here in the builds. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, it helps Viper a lot that he's got four relics, and that's the reason why he prioritized it so much. But those hand cannoneers are paying for their price so well, and Ooh. we talked about the longbows firing so rapidly with their bows when they're under the aura of the towers or town centers. How about those hand yeah, cannoneers just unleashing hell? Yep, they are shredding right through their targets, but the longbows, they got good value. If you look at the trade overall, a lot of hand cannoneers did go down for this. And the Lombo salute is never ending. We do have to remember there is a, a very big price discrepancy between a hand cannon and a Lombo. So one on one, if each are getting traded out evenly or close to evenly, it's going to favor the player that's pushing the Lombos. Looks like the military population of Viper took a big beating. He was down to 60 or so for a brief moment, but he's not back on track still. Operating with mostly longbows and men at arms and look at that defensive cost on the left side It's such a good position to be in trying to hold off the left side of the farming eco, uh -oh. but now over chops in hold the middle Uh-oh uh, uh he... It seems that your bucket is leaking sir <laughs> Beastie's in and that's gonna force reactions on both sides the bomb bars start to shift up as well So Beastie will peel them back for the moment Needs to get some more hand cannons in the mix to protect him, but right now he's prioritized on flooding through. And this is worrying because it's on the eastern side of Viper's base, meaning that static force that's now parked on the left has to do the truffle shuffle. They have to run a marathon to get across and cut BC off. Yeah, and that's going to be concerning because, as you pointed out, it's all about attrition warfare right now. Can you drain down the opponent's economy before you'd run dry? Viper also having limited amount of wood to work with and Beastie shifted away from longbows, Viper did not, so sustainability right now is on the side of Beastie with the unit compositions that they currently have. 
Oh, now if he loses the Trebs, needs to get them back quickly. They're a pricey investment this stage. I mean, yes, the Wingard Palace makes them cheap, but the investment has been timed to build up that army. So he will wheel it back on the southern eastern side behind his walls and keep at least three of the Trebs alive. In fact, I think maybe two of them went down. That being said, BC can afford to throw away a few Trebs, can't he? Because if you look at the top right, you might <laughs> notice that he has quite a few more long-range siege than Viper does. 11 traps to talk about. I mean, Beastie probably start deleting villagers even because he's down to 85, 150 in military, and that's going to be a ton of firepower. That much firepower can melt a castle in a split second. And you get the feel that Beastie wants to finish this game here. He feels like there is blood in the water on the left side. And that's a Reboto Quinn. Did I see a Reboto Quinn? Oh, man. Yep. I, I, you know, buddy, if, if, you know, if the Muslim can't make the final day, we need something to fall here. So the Reboto Quinn will make an appearance. And honestly, it's actually not that bad against ranged armies because if you actually check the Robotican, it comes with a lot of missile resistance and quite a chunky health pool. So it's barely going to get tickled and it might actually find its value. It's usually seen as a meme, but recently I've been somewhat impressed. See that 600 health on this unit? Good luck yeah. insta-killing it. And the thing is that the Rebolder Queen is great when against massed units, especially against melee units. It has a short range. It's like a big shotgun you have to think about. Against massed men at arms, it can be very effective, especially if you have a meat shield in front. In the scenario that it's being used right now, it's perfect. And let's not forget, it's also being affected by the castle's aura, so the rate of fire on that bad boy is brutal. Oh my god, and Viper, he doesn't even benefit from deleting his own walls here. He hasn't got enough troops in the melee slot. Instead, he pushes forward with the hand cannon. His hand cannon is trying to get in, and they done it! Screw you, Robotikins! Get out of here! Wait until you've been buffed. You're not welcome in this neighborhood. You can tell I feel very passionately a certain <laughs> way about Robotikins. I love Robotikins. I mean, it's a fun little unit out there. Work. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard, hard to make them work. It's, 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 it's kind of wacky as well. Like, I, I, you know, as a kid, I don't know if you ever played Cossacks. I love Cossacks. And they had the, the multi-cannon, right? Which is kind of like the Robotican. That thing was broken. Then I come to this. It's like two extremes, right? Extremely good and extremely bad. The Robotican never actually feels like a great unit unless you have these amazing choke points like right here. Yeah, it's, I think probably the ultimate definition of a situational unit. In certain scenarios, like the battle that we have seen, it's really effective. And other times, it's a horrible, horrible unit. But now you see Beastie setting up with the trench warfare out there, and he's got a lot of trebuchet firepower. He's dropping those walls to make sure that the opponent can't just respond to those traps with spring bolts or bombards. Because if mm -hmm. you hide those traps behind the walls, you can still fire. But direct line of sight units, like for example, spring bolts, they won't be able to hit them behind those walls. And the crazy part is it's very hard to get all the sprinkles now. Like, Viper has held a lot of wood, but his, his build has been half wood type units, right? With the Lombos constantly for this game. So even though it looks like he's hoarding, like a Schmeagle in, in forest form, it's because he wants to keep this composition going long term. It's because he believes it's still the way he wins this game. And he, he might be right if this game goes another 20, 30 minutes. But Beastie's knocking on your door with 11 trebuchets coming at both sides of your base. It's going to be difficult to reach that hour mark at this rate. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Viper is up to 101 army though, so army numbers very close. And you get the feel that Viper wants to take a decisive battle to repel that counterattack. Because, oh, Henkin is behind that wood line and you see Viper oh. having a harder and harder time accessing wood. But he's going to be Ooh. quite effective taking up these trebuchets in the middle though. So he can punish these expansions from Beastie quite effectively. Yeah, it's, it's a weird trade. Here, kill some villagers and lose a bunch of trebuchets. He's finally reacting to pack it up, but the man at arms are already on top of you, so they'll be able to torch one. Might even get a second. The villagers even be pulled. Now, remember that in terms of efficiency of this trade, it's not great because Beastie's building these out of the Weingar Pass, but the rate at which he can replace them is incredibly slow. Remember that pushing the units out of that building is 1 minute and 15 seconds per new trebuchet. So while it is cheap, it takes a hell of a lot of time to rebuild. Exactly. The concern that is growing and growing for Viper right now is that those trebuchets are getting closer and closer to that monastery. And as you see on the screen, indeed, 115 to make it. And more importantly, if you're pop capped like Beastie is, you're not producing anything because it's stuck mm. in there. So you only start popping them out when you start losing stuff, which means that uh -huh. it's not like, you know, I'm um, 200 population for 10 minutes, so I can just reinforce myself with 50 more trebuchets. As long as you don't lose one, you're not getting a new one. And sure thing, you get the first new one fast, but then you have to wait 115 again. So you lose three trebs, you will get one new, and then you have to wait two and a half minutes for the upcoming so, so two. 
So what you're saying is Viper's actually doing BC a favor. And the, I don't feel like BCs return the favor the same way. These buildings going down are definitely stinging Viper. That was the townfall in the monastery, which means he's not getting that passive trickle of 400 gold per minute. And you're going to watch the income number sink. It's going to be very difficult for Viper to keep this composition up. Because remember that he now also went into hand cannonades. Yeah, it's going to be insanely difficult to keep this up. And I feel like Beastie has found the perfect angle to strike from. Because not only is he leveling the base of Viper right now to the ground, including that key monastery, he's also disrupting the farming eco. So as you pointed out, mm. that gold income is going to plummet. You see so many villagers having to be pulled back from those farms. And now we're getting close to the position where Beastie could start considering shelling those key landmarks. Because as you see on the right side of the screen, we are rather close to that council hall, the starting town center, oh. the King's Palace. I think the Vingard Palace is actually at the front, so yeah. it's going to be difficult to destroy. But it's not impossible I for Beastie at this pace. I mean, you say it's going to be difficult, but realistically, if, if you think about it, BC can just come from the south, build a second wall. I know, right? Building walls with Trebuchet, who would have thought it? And then he could just take it out. Like right now, he's in full chill mode. And the issue that Viper has is because he went for all these man of arms, how do you ever get to the Trebuchets? How do you ever kill them quick enough? You don't. He needs a transition and he needs it soon. The issue he has is with limited wood remaining and gold as well. Like what is your option? You have to build the stables and then what? Fork out wood for horsemen or fork out gold for knights? Viper is pulling off the big relic haste though, and you gotta love that. You gotta pick those relics up while you still can for Viper. He knows that they are very important. If you look at that gold income per minute, it's currently sitting at 700 per minute for him, 1700 for Beastie. So he really can't mm. afford to lose all those relics out there. He needs those. As you pointed out, he's being bottlenecked by gold income right now to replenish his army. I love that from Beastie, by the way. Like he finally realized that Viper was sneaking through that weirdly kind of funky looking wall that had fallen. He's like, I can't figure out which one of these needs to be rebuilt. I'm just going to build a longer wall up the wood line so he definitely can't sneak in because the Viper was trying to snake in there. If he gets enough damage done, you think maybe there's wiggle room to come back. But he doesn't know what we do, which is that Beastie is floating 15,000 surplus resource. He's not running out anytime soon, even if you raid his eco lines. So you're telling me there is a chance for a wonder? Hmm. Maybe. I think he got... Mm, I think, did he get Typhons with that one relic? Because otherwise, I don't know how he's getting enough stone, let it go. Typhons could do it. N no memes. He's got yeah, some way to go. Yeah, you, you get the feel that he just wants to finish this game in the conventional way. Viper is picking those relics up, so he's going to have that gold income back. But now, those trebuchets are setting up. You could potentially think about starting to take down some of those palisades from Viper, though. I mean, if you're beastly. Because... Having that bottleneck out there is never really a good sight. You see, if you have to pull back your trebuchets, it's going to be a concern. And now he's thinking about... Is he thinking about... What? What is this? <laughs> well, luckily, uh, roadkill doesn't exist in this game. Well, that'd be a lot of dead man at arms. <laughs> the trebuchets, not sure if they're coming or going. And look at the size of the army from Viper. Line formation for maximum intimidation will scare BC away. He lives for the moment, but but it's just feeling like death by a thousand cuts. Like, look how much of his base is piles of rubbles. And also, look at the small groups of military forces that keep wiggling their way in on the eastern front. Because Viper has to stand guard on the west at all times. Yeah, that's the concern here for Viper. And strictly speaking, Beastie could think about starting to cap those sacred sites as well to compensate for his relic deficit or potentially even force Viper to make a move because right now Viper is on the full defense mode. And Beastie, anytime Viper launches a counterattack, he's just going to camp on the top of these walls and repel those attackers. Very nicely use walls out there for Beastie. Yeah, not quite enough range to kill Lombos, but it's just, it's so problematic to kill units on walls at that stage. Like 66% health uh, damage reduction on a 150 health unit. Like, good, good luck. You're going to be standing there a very long time. I'm pretty sure if he started firing trebuchet shots back at you, you'd die quicker than whatever you're firing at on the wall. Viper floating 16,000 food right now. Beastie sitting at 15,000. Both of the, these players floating a ton of resources. Neither of the players decided to go for trade, which is probably what you would expect from the English, but that is the first volley coming out towards the Wingard Pass, and we talked about that landmark being one of the prime targets, especially if you combine this push with a push from the left side as well towards the other landmarks. And he's forced to push in. Springles are starting to be produced, but this is the issue. You let the walls go up. He has no solution to this, and in fact, Beastie, if he sets up a second stone wall in front of this one, he can just siege that down and the Springles do nothing. 
And this is why neither player is bothered with Springwolves for so long. Because even when they were both going to trebuchets, they understood they'd done nothing the moment the stone wall went up. Yeah, that's exactly it. There is no point in going Springwolves because the stone walls will just, will just shelter all of those trebuchets. That is exactly what Beastie has done on the left side. On the right side, he's yet to do that, though. But he's slowly suffocating Viper over here. Really, Viper has minimal map control. Viper is trying to launch some counterattacks every once in a while, but oh. those have minimal effect. Well, I'm seeing a big problem here. Notice that Viper is putting some effort into breaking out to the west. But if you look, there's barely anything left on the west. Beastie has strip mined it. It's all about the east now, which Viper has a small contingent on, but he needs to actually reprioritize his attention there. However, that's problematic when there's this many trebuchets staring at your base from just across the road. And it looks like Beastie's committing. He's sending in the men at arms to the back of Viper's base. It is going to be the same story again. Just make the opponent pursue all those men at arms at the back of the base. Use that as a diversion. And I would think that the moment Beastie sees that Viper is pulling back forces to clean this up, he's going to target that Wingard Palace. Oh, and here we go. Hand cannon is moving in. Premium unit. Darks out the Springles. Springles trying to actually counter out against the trebuchets. It's just not enough of them here, though. And the trebuchet count is too thrifty from Beastie. Still seven on the front line. Retreat will come out for the meantime from Beastie. But it's all for Viper to lose. One mistake is all it's going to take in this situation. And that's the problem. These walls up with the staging point. Beastie can afford to lose two good fights before he even has to worry about Viper. Viper, however, all it takes is one. Yeah, and he took down the Vingard Palace out there. And you know what it costs to repair those buildings? It costs wood. The only resource that the players don't have a ton of uh, resources or ton of uh, accessible from. Whoa, whoa, don't do stone huh? like that, okay? I mean, if we wanted a wonder victory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right about that one, stone, but Viper looks like he's going to commit a lot of wood to repairs, so he's going to get the Vingard Palace back. He knows the importance of that. Yeah, and these raids, still frustrating. It feels like Viper is responding with double the force each time. Clean up on Isle Beastie as he'll be able to clear up this eastern side, not only of the stragglers harassing his eco lines, but now also go back to drain those resources. And you can see the resource drain effectively here. Like someone has balanced their economy and I'm not going to give any points out to anyone who chat who can tell me which player's done it because these numbers are not even close right now between the two players. Okay, so there's a stone mine on the left side and we are still seeing 400 stone per minute for Beastie. And I cannot help but wonder if Beastie could think about a wonder here. I know it sounds crazy, but this is the exact same thing that we said in the game that they actually ended up being a place of wonder. It has been a stalemate for the last 10, 15 minutes. And Beastie, I mean, just look at his resources. He's got the gold for it. He's got reasonable amounts of wood to work with and his unit composition doesn't require a lot of it. The stone is still a distant dream, but I mean, the safest play to play this one for Beastie might actually be thinking about the wonder at this point. Lyrical, you, you're trying for it too hard, buddy. Like, you gotta be more subtle about it. For, <laughs> for example, this. Hey, KP, how, how, how does someone win this game? You know, I've been wondering that for like 10 minutes now, and I'll probably be wondering that for like 15 minutes from now. So you see, now we're getting the subtlety because that stone number is slowly increasing. He isn't investing in too much more than a few walls here or there, but for the moment, it feels like Beastie is still confident in the trebuchet plan, understanding that the Viper is stuck in a hole and he still can't find a way out. And you know what the crazy part is? Beastie hasn't even reprioritized efforts towards getting that third sacred site. He's willing to sit here for two hours if that's what it takes to get the dub. Yeah, it's so wonderful to cast with you, I have to say. Now, he's up to Springholds as well, so he's ready to start taking down Viper's trebuchets. And you see, he's just slowly expanding those uh, trenches out there. He's working towards those remaining forests, and the Handkandir's still working to create effect. And this is probably what separates the two armies, or what distinguishes the two armies over here. A lot of Handkandir's on the battlefield for Beastie right now. Mm hmm All I know for sure is that however this one plays out, it's going Sacred to be a victory. monumental victory for whoever can take it. But right now, Sacrilege is being committed. BC has gone for the first Sacred Site after we mentioned it. And now the Wall Shuffle, the Hand Cannon is with the high ground. Actually, differential between them and the Lombo only at 0.5 power range at that point. So it's kind of inconsequential. It means you can mask these man at arms as you move out. But one key detail for BC, if he wants to do this correctly, he's going to need to keep building gates as he shuffles out the walls. Yeah, exactly. Or you see the walls are being, being broken you. through. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to be... Gate, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's essentially oh. a natural gate. Viper is just shelling those walls left and right. Springle is getting taken down by the flaming arrows. Looks like many of those Springles got slightly missed micro. 
but look at the trebuchet fire from behind those trenches. The firepower is just unreal, and let's not forget, those bad boys do have area damage with the Shattering Projectiles upgrade. And Viper, he's nine minutes away from defeat unless he can neutralize one of those sacred sites. In this matchup, we have seen Beastly winning with a wonder already in the winner's bracket. Now it's a rematch in the loser's bracket. Could we see maybe a sacred site victory? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the trebuchets, the shattering projectiles. I'm kind of curious at, the, at this stage, Lytical. Uh, have you been taking notes? Have you got any stats for me? Like, what kills more units now? Shattering projectiles or maganels? Shattering projectiles. It's actually... Didn't even it, hesitate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean... Especially if you consider that it's so, so easy to replenish those trebuchets with the Wingard Palace as compared to manganels that are super expensive. You have longer range. Mm. It really is, like, it sounds stupid, but trebuchets with shattering projectiles is actually more effective killing units right now than mangonels, or at least it's a better investment. So what you're saying is the English are about to become the best Civ in uh, Age of Empires 4. They're, they're a little bit overdue if that does happen. I mean, all I know for sure about that stat, though, Lydical, is that the, the end of this series, or the end of this game, rather, the English are going to be the winning Civ. I can guarantee you that much. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with you on that one. It's very difficult to accomplish a tie in Age of Empires 4, let's just say that. With that being said, we have 7.50 left on that timer. Viper is progressing towards that right-hand side sacred site, which is realistically the only one that he can decap, to be honest. Yeah, and he's hard committing for it. The, the weakness of this, however, is this could be a bait. The moment he shifts out of position, notice that Beastie could still wheel in with the trebuchets and go back to the landmark victory. And that's why Viper keeps doing this skirting like this. He's very kind of Shayla Faye, shall we say. He doesn't want to fully all in because he knows what's going to happen. He'll be wrapped on the moment he does. And right now, the hand cannon is just keeping him at bay. The mask room continues. Beastie understands at this stage with the resources that he's built up in reserve, he doesn't have to win this fight. He just had to delay it, kick it down the road, minute by minute, until Viper gets to the desperation point on that countdown. Yeah, I have to agree with you on this one. And to be honest, if you're BC right now, you start considering adding some more hand cannons, some more mad terms, potentially even at the expense of deleting some villagers, because it's gonna be all about holding that right hand side sacred side. You could play for a very long game over here and, you know, just maintain the current economy that you have. But you get the feel that this game is likely going to end with a Sacred Sight victory here, at least from Beastie's perspective. If he really wants to win this game, that's his best option right now to do so. I, I wouldn't be against Beastie just wheeling out some walls actually towards that Sacred Sight. You know, maybe keep the hand cannoneers range advantage right next to there. Make it a little bit more frustrating for Viper, but it's already feeling frustrating enough. I mean, Viper starting to push out a few knights from the Wingard Palace, just trying to get something that can get on that point, right? The keeps are slowly being depleted for Beastie, and the wheel out here, the trebuchet is in mass, ready to blitz straight towards that sacred site, but he needs to be fast about it. Six minutes remaining, doesn't have to rush in instantly, but he knows that Beastie's gonna be fighting with him tooth and nail every step of the way. Yeah, Beastie still has some trebuchets on the left side, so he could think about targeting that Wingard Palace and then sniping the trebuchets. The trebuchets are still there in large numbers, five or six of them on the battlefield. I think the castle is slowly going down for Beastie. It's still alive. You can see the arrows flying in from the right side, but Viper is about to take it down, I think. And also, look at the size of the force now. Like, Beastie is a little bit deplenished. He's rebuilding the forces behind the walls, but this offers up an opportunity. Viper should be able to quickly decap this point. But he really is taking his time. He's very methodical about this. A lot of players by now would have rushed out and maybe risked it. But he wants more info before he does so. And there it is. Shifts out now. Understands Beastie's not going to be able to come in force quick enough. And also, if he does rush to get on that sacred site, it's going to be a bloodbath. And look at the army here for Viper. We haven't talked about his hand cannoneers. Now he's up to 40 hand cannoneers and 60 men at arms. Oh. Down to 66 oh. villagers. It's full army. Yeah, and look, look, Beastie's going for the raid, but he's also fighting the sacred site. So he's baiting his opponent into a fight there. And look at the mask on both sides. Springles trying to snipe out at long range, trying to prevent the decap, but it is going through. The question is whether Beastie splitting up his forces will find more value. Remember, although he loses his fight, he has wrapped into the base and he's on Viper's economy lines again. Yeah, Viper had to commit so much for this one. And I think what Viper had to sacrifice for this to a certain extent is sustainability. He had to delete so many villagers so that he can reach a critical mass of army that he can use to decap that sacred site. You see, he's down to 60 villagers and he's down to 300 gold. Ooh. So yeah, Viper's army looks scary right now. 115 military population, but how is he going to replenish that? 
On the other side, if you take a look at Beastie, though, his army is also looking very powerful, 140, so identical number to Viper, but the resource bank is looking a lot more convincing, and the eco is looking a lot more convincing. Oh, and the massacre. This is not good. Viper, the way he's responding to this, there's a trickle in the troops. There's just too many ranged units here instantly blitzing him as he comes in one by one. And it feels like Viper is just getting down with left, right, and center. Like you said, the, the resource drain is becoming a problem, especially considering how reliant he's become on a composition of mana, arms, and hand cannons. It doesn't get more gold pricey than that. Yeah, it's very, very expensive as well for him. Food, of course, is not an issue, but gold is. And you see he's down to 35 gold in the bank, down to 52 villagers, and that's the growing concern. He's slowly losing his army. He's down to 103 military population, and he's dropping in population. Beast is steady at 200 for the last 20 minutes. Viper now down to 165, and it is dropping rather than increasing. Uh, yeah, BC, but well, one thing we can confirm is looking less likely that it's going to be a, a wonder victory. The stone is down at 320 at this stage, so at least it's going to come down to a bloodbath, but it might not take much longer at this rate. I mean, Viper, the wood depleting, the gold, as we've already mentioned as well. When you make this comparison between the two, BC can just kind of blindly throw crap at the wall and see what sticks. In fact, if he wanted, he could easily switch into Horseman now and burn everything in Viper's base to the ground. Yeah, potentially, or actually preferably Knights, because... We talked about this one, food and gold is infinite, whereas wood isn't. So you probably don't want to spend your remaining wood on horsemen. Knights actually might be a more reasonable choice, but I do agree with you. I think here, if he starts switching into cavalry, if he feels like it, that could be an option to try and get some more raiding done. But I think he is satisfied with the unit composition that he currently has. He probably knows that there is blood in the water at this point because Viper, his army numbers have been slowly decimated over the last 15 minutes or so. Yeah, we, we, we know how it is with BC, right? He's a methodical player. He doesn't feel this need to rush to end if he knows he's in control of the game. Right now, BC, the way he's playing this, he's looking and saying, Viper, baby, we got to talk. You've got to do something. You've got to change the status quo because right now, I'm very comfortable, okay? Five course meals, beautiful diner, giant mansion. Like, I am thriving and you are a hobo living in a box on the street. you got to do something. Yeah, Man in Arms once again trickling into that food eco here from Viper. Viper is trying to get back on track with the villagers and he still has a scary force of hand cannoneers. But as you pointed out, Beast is so, so methodical as a player. So he's really not going to rush this one. If this game takes 10 hours, he's going to take his time and win it like that. He's not going to rush. He's not going to take any risks. He knows that he has an advantageous position and he just wants to make sure that he closes out the game as methodical as possible, as slow as possible, really, if it's needed. Yeah, I mean, like we said, it's his style, right? It's what he's comfortable with. Viper, he usually relies on that kind of more greedy boot, allowing him to then exploit that, that kind of 20, 30 minutes timing. Now that we get into this drag of late game, you're starting to see how these playstyles match up. Like, BC has been hoarding. It's the bank of BC right now, and Viper has been non-stop spending. It's like every time he's changed the look of his house, he needs to do it again, right? Whoever's living there isn't happy with the latest decor. And it means that these switch-ups, it's just draining him. Like, he's at 41 gold. I feel like every time I'm looking up that number, it's barely ever reaching into triple digits. Yeah, and the thing is at this point for Beast is that he once again reconquered this right-hand side so he could once again cap the sacred side and force Viper to make a move again. Viper's going to take a great engagement against those trebuchets on the left side, though. It's not like four or five. Ooh. So there's definitely yeah, some value in Viper's army still, but he's just well, slowly getting there. Yeah, he's getting the same. Close. Yeah, he's torching Trebs, so it ends up being an equal trade, and BC uses a lot less troops to get that. And now after the fact, like, look at the size of the armies coming out. The mana arms numbers, BC is looking a lot more healthy. The hand cannon is as well. This is what we've been waiting for. Like, this is not your instant flash and it's over in, in, in the blink of an eye, right? This has been slow but steady, and you can see it now clearly when you look at the ratio of hand cannon is and mana arms. Even the Trebs, although they're even now, it's the rate at which they're getting depleted on each side. It feels like every time I'm looking, BC has around 10 Trebs, and then Viper is struggling to get past five or six. And now Beastie starts adding man, um, not men at arms, rather than bombards out here. He also has a lot of men at arms, of course, on the battlefield, but bombards, that's a sign that he's hoarding a lot of resources. And when Viper sees that, he's gonna be like, oh shoot, he can afford bombards. That's a bad sign. Yeah, it's worrying now because these man at arms, although they're chunky boys and they're a decent front line, it really does just turn into 10 pin bowling with the bombards in the field. It's, it's very hard if you cannot reach them. And, and we know you're not going to, right? We've seen how these front lines play out because they're both playing the English with the armor clad upgrade and the man at arms. They stand there for a very long time, 
even when they're being attacked by hand cannon is. And it means that actually having superior siege for sniping units can easily be the edge in these fights. It's going to be a trebuchet warfare on the right side here. And Beastie, once again, he's shifting to the left side. So he wants to go for those landmarks. He knows the position of all of those. He can stall on the right side and then go in on the left side. And that is exactly here what he he's goes. doing right now. And he's fast about it as well. The man arms shifting in. Bombard's wheeling through. Where's the response from Viper? He's shifting across his base in a rush here. Keep going up defensively. King's Pass is seen, as is the Council Hall. Troops are now starting to respond here. Needs to get on the hand cannon is, and here it comes. The flood for a unit. Beastie QT forced to react and shift away. Bombards are a little bit too slow. And it means that he will have to come back and try again another day, as Viper will not make it that easy to end Dry Arabia here, as we are now well over an hour into just game one. Yeah, very long and grindy game. I mean, typical beastie game that we're looking at over here. The Bombards are getting taken down from that traffic jam once again. Those Ooh. narrow holes are causing a lot of chaos here and a lot of problems for Beastie. He gets away with one of the Bombards. Pretty decent engagement for him. He also was taking a fight on the right side. I think Beastie's understanding that he can afford to just spam units into the units of uh, Viper because oh he knows that replenishing God. is going to be much easier. But Viper is still at 140 military population. Yeah. Yeah. Viper is not yeah. dropping. What's happening? Yep, Viper's, Viper is pushing him back right now. It's the attack speed buffer on those Lombos. It's kind of make the difference. The hand cannon is all targeting the same individual unit, while the Lombos are peppering down these hand cannoneers. And although Beastie did sneak in a small contingent onto the Trebs on the right side, damage was minimal. He still keeps a healthy number up and also buffers Beastie away on the left side. And now you have to question, is this the moment where Viper looks to stonewall that up? Because it's become a liability. This is the fifth, sixth, seventh, I don't even know how many times Lidical, I'm bad with counting, but it's been a lot of times that Beastie has raided through that left opening now in this game. Yeah, Viper could really use some walls over there, some stone walls. He did lose the Wingard pass in the middle, and that's a growing concern for him right now because he's going to have to repair that to be able to afford trebuchets. But Viper actually got back in terms of population, so he was at 200 just a couple of seconds ago, only at 65 villagers. And let's not underestimate the importance of those four relics because one of the most precious resources now late game is going to be population. So having 400 extra gold per minute essentially from a position where it's not costing uh, you any um, population. Any ego, on, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, it's not like you have to add 10 more villagers to be able to sustain this production. And that is a massive value that you could see uh, Vodka selected the monastery for us for a brief moment, is that he's also getting the stoned wood and food from it. So he's gotten tithe barns as well. Nice little extra trickle of resources from that too. Yeah, it's quite amazing actually. Tithe barns got ignored for a very long time. Recently started getting picked up Quite frequently, actually, now by players. It gives, I believe it's 30 of food and wood. It's meant to give 30 stone as well. It was bugged and it used to give 15. Now it shows up as giving 20. So still bugged from what the devs said it was going to be. Maybe they'll eventually fix that. Or maybe this is just a nerf to uh, walling in their own little cute way. But speaking of walls, it's going to go down. Viper able to breach through. Doesn't go into the walls to try and address. Now he goes in with the man at arms. Push back the hand cannon is Reduce damage on both sides. And the wraparound straight on the trebuchets and they are not packing up the move away they're packing up and running straight towards the maas village is trying to keep him repaired hold for the moment and now on the wall viper with his longbows he gets the damage reduction that means the man at arms can't easily play into this trebs are gonna live at least and now sacred sites back under control of beastie he once again gives himself the win condition I mean, it's such a crazy game over here. Just think about that. Viper diagnosing that he can take the walls and he can be the one getting the extra range and the damage reduction on the right side. The villagers are trying to take down that monk, trying to decap the sacred side again. This could be a short-lived effort for that sacred side victory. I don't know how Viper is holding on in this one, but boy, this is getting closer and closer to one of the best games I've ever seen. Yes, it's right right now, there's kind of a risk that maybe someone just, they just typed each other. Should we call this one a draw and remake? Because it's just a complete stalemate. Although BC keeps gaining some ground, it's never enough to decisively end the game. And Viper always finds a way to regain the territory. But this is a true test of it now. This is the most we've seen Viper retreat. And it's because he's getting stretched. He reacted on the left side. He went out of position and now the Wingard Palace is a little bit exposed. The trebuchets, although they might be able to take it down, you can't go any further. Lombos are quick to react. And he says, Beastie, get back in your pen, you dog. You're not coming out anytime soon. Yeah, a lot of trebuchets being sniped from both sides, to be honest, because Viper is probably going to commit against the traps, shelling that Wingard Palace out there. Looks like these are going to get away here. Man, I'm trying to pursue. And this is the first night that we have seen for a long, long time. You see, it has the elite upgrade. Could be a sign of things to come here because Beast is probably realizing that infantry isn't going to crack it. Instead, he's switching into cavalry. Somewhat surprisingly, horsemen, oh, though. 
It's his gold. It's his gold. Because we've been so focused on Viper. Like, you started to highlight it, right? The relics are the, the passive gold. BC is also suffering from this eco pop cap situation. He's depleted himself down to 80. There's barely any gold left to tap on the map, if any at all. And it means that if he goes into Knights, he can't afford to replace the trebuchets. He can't keep getting the hand cannon is. This is an astute choice by Beastie. If there's one thing he has a lot of right now, it's food and wood. And if there's one thing that can win you the game quickly, it's this unit that costs food and wood. And the Russian is there. Horseman rushing across the walls going up. Pipe up. Roll playing Attack of Titan right now. I just don't know if it's going to be quick enough to get the Horseman out. However, I don't think this number of Horsemen are going to be good enough to get the Landmark Snipe either. Yeah, he's targeting the King's Pass right now. Viper has the HP upgrade on those buildings. You can see that on the overlay, plus 750 HP. The King's Pass is a very fragile building. It's only 2,500 HP by default. It looks like Beast is going to be able to snipe it, but there is still the Council Hall, the starting Town Center to take down. The raid is great here for Beastie, but it's going to be insufficient to clean up all four landmarks. No, but it is one down, and now he's going to try to hang around for the Monastery. Oh, Torch damage just not looking good enough, though. And Beastie, I mean, he could maybe raid through, see if anyone's still operating on the farms. But look what it's doing. Because Viper overreacted, he now realizes the mistake he made. He's going to shift back to the front line, and he's getting pinched on two sides. This is the thing that Beastie has done time and time again throughout this game. He doesn't just take one fight. He distracts you. He drags you left and right. And Viper is running around his own base all the time like a headless chicken. And behind this one, you still have free sacred sites right now for Beastie. So there is a countdown going on. It's all about that diversion. And we talked about the gold issues for Beastie. Having those sacred sites now compensates him for having lower amount of relics here. So he's able to really buffer this up just by having that raid out there. Now the horseman hit the field. Viper was on hand cannoneers and longbows for a long, long time. And the horseman will be a perfect response to those. This just feels like donations of corpses to each side, like never really giving any true ground. But as you highlighted, it's the sacred side that matters. And he's back in with the horseman. This might be enough. If he torches that down, that starves Viper out. We have to rebuild it. And remember the wood. It's the staff resource, uh, resource for both sides, right? Although Beast has a lot in reserve, it's hard to find additional wood at this stage of the map. So just affording your, uh, pushing your opponent rather to invest 200 wood to just rebuild and reclaim what they once had is a sting for Viper that he can't easily afford. Exactly. Viper actually sent villagers out there to repair, but you see he's down to 100 wood in the bank right there. Villagers are also being pulled to the northern side. Sacred sites are being decapped, so the sacred site victory is now gone. But slowly but surely, Beast is pushing up the Twingard Palace is set on fire. And with that, it's probably going to be taken down. Viper very slowly yeah, being crowned down. He hasn't got much left. What, two? Landmarks to get through, and then it's going to be a dub for BC. I mean, those landmarks aren't hidden in the back of your base anymore. They're very much exposed to left the flank. And Viper, although he did put those stone walls to protect himself, remember the trebuchets can fire over them and everything they need is in range if they get close enough. So Viper now has to make sure he defends both the south and western side. And he's not defending the west. The Rapin, the Horseman getting around the side. Not any Longbowmen left to protect here. Viper, he's depleting quick. Look at his pop cap. It's shrinking. And with it, he is shrinking alongside it from this game. Horseman, raid in. Lombos having to deal with the front line. The gap closes there, pushes him back. Viper going low on the troops, hard to replace them fast enough. Remember, every strike at the front of the base was diminishing his ability to replenish as both not only were his troops going down, but his military production buildings as well. Yeah, all the production is going down here, man. I mean, I don't know how Viper can stop this anymore. His military population is dropping so, so rapidly. He's drained of wood, he's drained of gold. His food he is running out it. and Viper is going to call it. Death by a thousand cuts, we talk about a lot. This felt like death by a million cuts. Beastie, absolutely rentless. With the constant raids on the left and right flank, Viper never able to find a foothold to push back. You felt like it was a matter of time. And although the time went an hour and 14 minutes, maybe we should be thankful it wasn't longer because folks, this game is just game one. And this could very easily ended up like round one of Golden League where we were sitting here twiddling our farms close to two hours into a match. Oh, I mean, what a spectacular show, really hard to find words for such a long and grindy game. And really, this is going to be depleting for both of these players. And you know who the real winner of this one is? We talked about this one the last stage where we also had some very long games in the final day of stage one. The real winner is going to be Marine Lord. He's sitting there waiting in the grand finals, <laughs> coming from the winner's bracket and just looking at this game, laughing and saying, Oh yeah, you just played game number one for one hour and 15 minutes and you could still potentially have four more games coming up. Very long and grindy game. Beastie takes the win here. Huge win as well.
Yeah, uh, phenomenally well done. Like, it was the switch up the horseman that done it, actually. That was the key detail. The issue that happened before for so long is, is whenever you go for static infantry, raiding is difficult. You might get into your opponent's base, but they're going to respond quick enough that you don't hang around to do any different damage that, that actually affects the outcome of the game. Notice how different this got the moment BC went for horsemen. 